There we go. Just some nice slides so you don't have to look exclusively at me for these few minutes. While we wait for a few more people to come in, I see that still some attendees are trickling in. So just gonna give it a bit more time so that they can join. And we'll get started in about a minute. Really glad to see the turnout. Good amount of people here in different time zones. All right. Well, I think that is just about enough time to let some people trickle in. We may see a few more join as time goes on, but I'm going to go ahead and kick things off so that we can get to the substance of the discussion today um, on C480S's latest report zoned out on economic development zones in the Mekong region. Um, good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever in the world you are today. My name is Thomas Ewing, and I'm the Chief of Analysis at C4EDS, the Center for Advanced Defense Studies, which is a 501c3 nonprofit located in Washington, DC. I'm very happy today to welcome you to this webinar on C4EDS's latest report, Zoned Out, a comprehensive impact evaluation of Mekong economic development zones. Today, I'm joined by the report's authors, Ben Spivak, Henry Peronin, and Maxwell Kearns, as well as my colleague, Faith Horner, who will be taking you through a summary of the report's findings, a tour of the interactive website we have designed to house the research, and the lessons that we believe are applicable to the future of economic development in the Mekong region. For those of you who are not familiar, C4EDS, um, again, a DC-based nonprofit, uses publicly available data, cutting-edge tech platforms, and innovative analytical approaches to research non-traditional security issues. We partner with technology companies, law enforcement, journalists, NGOs, and private enterprise to produce actionable, actionable reporting on illicit activity, including wildlife trafficking, corruption, proliferation, and human rights violations, just to name a few subjects. We seek to inform better, more targeted policy by a matrix of organizations to promote the overall health of the global system. This organizational mission, in this case, led us to focus on a particularly important question for Southeast Asian audiences, the growth of economic development zones in the region and their effects on local populations and prospects for prosperity for the future. Today, you'll hear from Ben, Max, Henry, and Faith as they give a summary of the project, outline key findings, and highlight features of our interactive website designed to give greater visibility on EDZ impacts for stakeholders in Southeast Asia and beyond. They'll also be highlighting ways that audiences in the region can gain a better understanding of the pros and cons of EDZs, especially insofar as they feature the involvement of outside actors. I'm really looking forward to a lively discussion today. Uh, just as a small housekeeping note, if you would like to participate in the discussion during the presentation by submitting a question for the authors, there is a Q&A box at the bottom of the screen uh, by now, I think more, more or less everyone knows how Zoom works, uh, but if you don't, just click on that and a dialogue box will come up to submit a question. My colleague Faith Horner will monitor the feed and the authors will take questions at the end of each section. So with that, I want to pass it over to my colleague Ben Spivak to begin the presentation and sit back with the rest of you and enjoy the research. So over to you, Ben. Thanks, Tom. Hello, everybody. Thank you all for joining us today uh, to hear about our research and to see the website in action. Uh, before we get started, uh, we'd like to do a quick poll uh, just to hear from you all a little bit about um, which country you're, you're most interested in uh, specifically you know, regarding the economic development zones. So I believe the poll will pop up here in a minute. Um, and if you can uh, go ahead and and respond to it. Uh, we'll just give everybody two minutes to respond.
Okay, we're, uh, we're gonna close the poll now uh, and we can see the results. All right, so pretty pretty even spread all around, uh, which is good because uh, we, we did look at all of these countries. Um, okay, well, thanks for that poll. Uh, before we jump into today's content, I wanted to provide some, some context to frame the presentation. So as Tom mentioned, uh, one of C4ADS's driving philosophical tenets is that illicit actors exploit licit systems of say transportation or communication uh, or finance. Um, we understand economic development zones to be hubs of listed infrastructure, uh, whether it's a, a manufacturing hub, uh, a um, re-export zone uh, or a, a commercial center. And because many EDZs use streamlined regulations to attract business, we see them uh, as potentially vulnerable to uh, exploitation by illicit actors. So when we set out to measure EDZ impact, we wanted to make sure an assessment, uh, to include an assessment of the vulnerability of this infrastructure uh, to exploitation by illicit actors. And we consider these uh, vulnerabilities as potential costs of the zone. Of course, it's no good discussing costs if you don't also talk about benefits. So on the other side of the coin, we were wanting to measure the contributions of EDZs to economic development. And given the number of zones in the varying data environments, uh, we chose an objective scalable metric for this that we'll get into in just a minute. And finally, we wanted to understand how to improve the net impact of economic development zones. And because so much literature already exists on growing the economic benefits, we focused principally on how to reduce negative outcomes by evaluating exposures of listed systems to legal activity. So we'll dive into the section specific findings in just a minute, uh, but I will lay out a few overarching findings now. So the first is through publicly available information, which C4RDS defines as any data that's freely or commercially available. And that's things like news reports, social media, trade records, satellite imagery, etc. So through publicly available information, we identified significant EDZ impact outside of traditional economic metrics. A second finding was that the state of the data environment around Mekong EDZs uh, has room for improvement. There was significant variation by country, uh, and I'm happy to discuss the reasons and remediations for that later. Uh, but this lack of access means that number one, governments don't have full visibility into the impacts of EDZs. And number two, local communities and other civil society resources cannot su uh, support zone evaluation activities. And that brings us to our third finding, that there is an opportunity to use data and partnerships to tilt the board towards net positive impact. And we believe that the best, if not the only way to do this is to collaborate. And you can see our recommendations there all involve partnership, uh, both between government agencies and across government and non-government EDZ stakeholders. One final note uh, is that throughout the project, we abstain from passing normative judgment on zones since barring infringements on things like basic human rights. Uh, it's ultimately up to the host governments to decide whether development is worth accepting um, certain unfavorable outcomes. However, we believe that policymakers should be fully informed on all EDZ impacts before making these decisions. So in pursuit of these goals, um, C4DS has developed a platform to put relevant data in the hands of zone stakeholders uh, and observers. Uh, so the website, uh, the platform contains a variety of different features. Um, firstly, all of the research from the study, including that found in the recently released report, Zoned Out. So this includes analysis around our three analytical verticals seen here uh, in the left, economic development, illicit activity and geopolitics, as well as five deep dives to highlight representative cases, uh, anomalies or emerging trends. And I will emphasize here that the deep dives are spread across a variety of different topics and shouldn't be taken as a collective group. In addition to the research, the website also contains a database of over 100 economic development zones across the Mekong region, and of course, specifically Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, Thailand, and Vietnam. The database contains some basic information about zones, as well as links to underlying sources. 
Finally, the website also has a partial mapping of corporate networks behind companies um, that are linked to the zone. So this is intended to shed light on the commercial infrastructure tied to EDZs. And this is, like we said, infrastructure that may be vulnerable to exploitation by illicit actors. So we'll explore these features during the website demo, uh, but first we'll walk through some of the findings and methodologies around our three verticals and highlight several of our deep dives. For that, I'll turn it over to Max, who will be starting uh, with our economic development section. Thank you, Ben. Uh, so as Ben said, our first analytical vertical is uh, economic development, which we analyze using nightlight data as a proxy. Um, and to dive right into the results, uh, the graph on the left shows the median zone. Um, and we can see that performance among these zones varies widely. For instance, uh, the median zone exhibits increased growth for the time period, period following its establishment, which is marked as year zero on that graph. However, uh, the graph in the center, we can see that the 25th percentile zone uh, shows that EDZs are not good for development in all cases. Um, many zones see stagnant or even negative growth uh, just after their establishment. And in order to take these measurements, we used high resolution nightlight data to compensate for scarce data in the region. So how did we do this? First, uh, we downloaded monthly composites from the Visible Infrared Imaging Radiometer Suite, or VIRS. These are published by the Earth Observation Group and Big Can Collection in 2012. Um, and nightlight data in this case is exactly what it sounds like. It's uh, satellite images of artificial light that is produced by humans um, on a, a daily or a monthly basis. Second, uh, for each downloaded file, we filter down to our areas of interest. Uh, in this case, our zones in all five countries. On the slide, we can see Thailand and the Eastern Economic Corridor. And then finally, for each pixel in this image, there's a radiance value, which denotes the strength of signal coming from each point on the map. For each uh, area of interest, we sum these values to get a sum of lights, which we then compare against the country's sum of lights to get a percent of lights estimate for each year in our data set, which is our metric for um, estimation. And using this number, we can compare across years for the same zone to see how the economic performance within that zone changes over time. And this is an established method to proxy for economic development. It's widely used in economic research, including in a 2017 publication by the World Bank that analyzed the development outcomes of special economic zones. These data are not without bias, however. For instance, different industries contribute differing amounts of nightlight, even with similar economic outputs. Mining and agriculture, for example, have very different outputs of light at night. For this reason, we only use nightlight data to compare economic performance within zones over time, rather than between zones that may have differing industries. Uh, and in general, monitoring development in these types of zones is difficult. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. Uh, there's little data in this region at the sub-state level, especially when boundaries, boundaries for the area of interest do not align with official administrative boundaries, as is often the case with special economic zones or economic development zones. Uh, therefore, the study proposes remote sensing as a solution for scaled up monitoring. Such methods are becoming increasingly available, and by partnering with satellite imagery and other remote sensing data providers, observers can use these data to monitor development of EDZs without relying on reporting from local officials. These data are biased, but they're objective, easily scalable, and available widely. And here by objective, I mean that co the coverage area of these uh, data sets are generally worldwide, and its biases are not based on human biases. And in particular, this study uh, explores three different types of remote sensing data. First, as we discussed, we have free open source nightlight data, which we use to proxy for economic development. Here we can see a graph of a particular zone with uh, that zone's establishment being marked by the red line. And next, uh, we partnered with Planet Labs, who use machine learning to detect buildings on high resolution satellite imagery over time. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and this allows for continuous monitoring of construction within zones. And we use nightlight data and a satellite imagery AI model to passively monitor zone development, tracking the expansion of MDS more to SEZ by the tri -FEEP group, a company sanctioned by the US Treasury for illegal logging and human rights abuses. The image on the slide shows the results of this model. On the top, we have the raw um, 
uh, imagery for Sihanoukville Special Economic Zone. And on the bottom, we have the annotated version of that, which uh, shows red wherever the model uh, detected a building. So we can look between January 2018 and December 2020 and see how much development occurred between that time period. And finally, um, we analyzed a massive amount of anonymous mobile phone location data, which we use as a proxy for human activity to see how people move around within the zone. We're able to show it's possible to detect the sites of future buildings in Seiseta development zone by analyzing the overlap between mobile phone location data and buildings detected using AI. So if you take a look at the slide, um, we're looking at inside of that box, we can see in April, 2019, that there's little uh, mobile phone location activity uh, in that box, and there's no development inside the box on the on the top image. Um, and then jump forward a few months to July, we can see significant uh, phone activity in that box, but still no, uh, no buildings. Um, and then jumping forward one more time, we can see still significant phone activity. And now there is a building in that location. So we can see that Perhaps in July 2019, we can see constructors work, construction workers, workers at that zone, which we can use to predict um, where building sites may take place. Um, and now, finally, we can jump in our, into our first deep dive, uh, which concerns the Eastern Economic Corridor. Um, and this is an example of a zone that performs relatively well, though, of course, not perfectly across the analytical verticals. It also highlights a common tension between national development priorities and local community interests. And for this deep dive, to supplement our analysis of publicly available information, we conducted interviews with several local stakeholders, including a retired resident, the director of an advocacy group, an MP from the Move Forward Party, and an MP from the Pelang Prakarat Party. And these interviews were conducted to collect varied on the ground data and perspectives that might not be captured in publicly available information from many local stakeholders. However, such information is anecdotal and not necessarily reflective of the respective populations, municipalities, or issues mentioned. The EEC performs well on economics and geopolitics. Uh, we see strong nightlight data growth and diverse foreign investment. Between 2018 and 2020, the percent of lights metric in the EEC increased by 14%, which is especially impactful given the size of the zone and that these three provinces have historically been some of the most developed regions in Thailand. And turning to geopolitics, even beyond investment, our research and interviews indicate that no one foreign country or actor appears to hold undue influence. So we can see economic development that's not shifting Thailand into a compromising geopolitical position. One possible driver of this growth is the EEC's highly centralized governance structure, which is laid out in the EEC Act. The EEC Act allows the EEC Policy Committee, which is chaired by the Prime Minister, to propose new laws and regulations directly to the Thai cabinet. More than half of the EEC Policy Committee is made up of cabinet members, and of the remainder, about half are political leaders like the Secretary General of the Board of Investment, and the other half are subject matter experts appointed by the Prime Minister. Now, this authority structure does not necessarily entail abuse. Nonetheless, this structure means that if the EEC policy committee decides that an amendment to the law would benefit zone development without prejudice, then the proposed amendment need only be approved by the cabinet, three quarters of whom sit on the policy committee. Now, to return to our analytical verticals, our research did identify negative consequences in the zone, such as land grabs, environmental degradation, and difficult working conditions. Industrial projects in the EEC are pulling water from Thailand's entire eastern region. This water is re reportedly not reaching local communities. One local resident described the water at his house as having a dark color as if it's an Ovaltine drink. And in terms of land disputes, locals allege that they have received pressure to give up land both from members of the military and private companies. In one case, a company allegedly set fire to a property in the zone to chase the residents off the land. Observers including an independent evaluation by the International Community of, Committee of Jurists, found that the Thai government has not effect, effectively legislated or enforced workers' protection, such as the minimum wage and local hiring quotas. Some workers in the zone have allegedly been denied wages, terminated for union involvement, and subjected to unreasonable working conditions. 
a government official confirmed that there is a mechanism for filing complaints around working conditions. However, the system is only available for registered workers. In spite of all these factors, locals were not categorically critical of development of the region, just the current execution. A more balanced power management structure with significant local input may reduce the negative effects of the zone. Um, and with that, I can turn to some questions. Faith, if we have any questions. Um, yes, Max, thank you. Um, just a reminder to everyone to use the Q&A box at the bottom. Um, if you have any questions, we do have a couple coming in. Uh, first question is, how much does it cost to use nightlight data in this way? What about satellite imagery? Uh, so in terms of the nightlight data, um, that's free and open source. It can be downloaded by anyone uh, from the Earth Observation Group. Um, basically, all it takes is a little bit of Python knowledge um, to, you know, code up the, the calculation of that metric. Uh, but in general, it is uh, free. Um, in terms of satellite imagery, um, we have partnerships with satellite imagery providers. Um, so in general, that cost is going to vary. I couldn't say in particular how much uh, you know any one provider would cost, um, but in general, um, it is definitely adv advantageous to you know create these partnerships um, for doing this uh, this type of work. Thanks, Max. Um, next question that came in is: Does the mobile phone data that you mentioned show individual locations? Uh, so it does. So the, the phone data is anonymous. Um, so we can't see the phone number or who is associated with that number. Um, and in the way we use it, we use it uh, in an aggregated way. So without, um, without depending on particular locations, uh, if you, if you saw our slides, uh, they're sort of heat maps. So we don't, we don't depend on any particular location of any one phone. Thank you. Um, and then the third question was, can you talk a little bit more about the nightlight data and how it can be both biased and objective? Sure. Good question. Um, so nightlight data offers a universally available metric. Um, it targets the ground truth of development more directly than economic statistics. Um, it's unbiased in its availability. All you really need is a bounding box for the, uh, the area of interest. Um, and separately from bias, another strength is that nightlight data is scalable, which allows us to analyze data for EDZs across the region. So in general, what I mean by that is that um, the measurement of nightlight data is unbiased, um, unbiased, excuse me, um, but it may be somewhat biased in how we use it to proxy for economic development. Um, so the bias is separate from sort of human input, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. Good question. Great. Thanks, Max. I think that is all the questions we have for you at the moment. Um, and we are going to turn it over to Henry, I believe. Thank you, Faith. So to assess illicit activity linked to EDZs in the Mekong region, we analyzed risk across four categories corruption, environmental degradation and conflict, money laundering, and trafficking of drugs and wildlife. Many EDZs across the region have been linked to public corruption, conflict over land ownership and land use, and environmental degradation. Others may serve as hubs for gambling and drug and wildlife trafficking, particularly those located in border areas. Next slide, please. Allegations of corruption related to the permitting, construction, and operation of regional EDZs were found across all countries. Like all forms of illicit activity, corruption is difficult to measure because it's intentionally hidden from public view. In some cases across Mekong countries, a lack of transparency surrounding the tendering and development process was sufficient to stoke distrust among local populations and fuel allegations of corruption. In other cases, more concrete evidence emerged in public sources of bribery on the part of EDZ developers, either in connection to the projects themselves or to developers' other business activities. Perhaps the clearest example of corruption concerning EDZs comes from Cambodia, 
where contracts for at least 12 EDZs were allocated to business tycoons with close ties to the government. This slide just shows a few examples of um, data sources that can be brought to bear on corruption related to EDZs. These include uh, local media reporting, as well as uh, public tendering documentation and corporate registry records. Moving on to the next slide, 60% um, of the uh, Mekong region EDZ, EDZs analyzed in our study were associated with at least one report of environmental degradation or conflict with local communities. Water and air pollution, often seen in connection with industrial activity, was the most frequently cited form of uh, environmental degradation. Other environmental impacts included deforestation, erosion, river diversion, and wildlife trafficking. These negative environmental effects often result from inadequate environmental impact assessment processes. In the case of Dawei SEZ in Myanmar, for example, an EIA that was supposed to be completed before project implementation was only executed after the completion of a major access road. Local communities along the road were neither invited to stakeholder consultations nor received information about the project as it was carried out. In some cases, the social impacts of EDZs are much more extreme. In Cambodia, Myanmar, and Thailand, for example, cases of forced eviction by public uh, security forces have been documented. This slide shows um, a few examples of data sources that can be used to investigate environmental degradation and land conflict. These include corporate registries, uh, as well as land titling and concession databases and high resolution satellite imagery, all of which C4ES has used to uh, investigate this topic. Moving on to the next slide, uh, trafficking of counterfeit contraband and illicit goods, in addition to drugs and wildlife is also a concern for EDZs in the region. The Mekong region has long hosted some of the world's largest wildlife markets and plays a vital role in the smuggling of African wildlife products, such as ivory, rhino horn, and pangolin scales as well as products from the region itself. The region is also home to a rapidly expanding trade in illegal drugs. Transnational criminal networks dedicated to the manufacture and smuggling of methamphetamine are expanding through the region, many displaced from China following law enforcement efforts to crack down on drug trafficking within its borders. Based on available data, EDZ's links to illicit wildlife and drug trafficking tend to be situated at international borders. In Vietnam, for example, at least eight wildlife seizures have been recorded at the Mong Cai SEZ, which has been identified by the Environmental Investigation Agency and NGO as a key border crossing for ivory being smuggled through Vietnam to China by organized criminal gangs aided by corrupt customs and border control officers. Several examples of data sources for monitoring trafficking of drugs, wildlife, and other illicit goods include social media profiles, local media reporting, police reports and court records, and transponder data from maritime vessels and aircraft. Moving on to the next slide, um, money laundering can occur in EDZs through a variety of mechanisms, including trade misinvoicing, investment in business and real estate, and the manufacture and smuggling of illegal counterfeit or regulated goods. Some EDZs in the Mekong region are vulnerable to money laundering through the rapidly expanding casino industry. Casinos offer a range of financial services that can be used for money laundering, from foreign exchange to check issuance, and host third-party intermediaries that can obscure gamblers' identities and activities. The most notorious example is Golden Triangle SEZ in Laos, but allegations of links to organized crime and money laundering have been directed at casinos across Cambodia, Thailand, and Myanmar. Several examples of data sources for monitoring trafficking of drugs, wildlife, and illicit goods include customs data, dark web activity, and corporate registries, to name a few. So to illustrate some of these dynamics, uh, we chose to study the relationship between transport infrastructure and EDZs in Northern Laos. We chose to study these interlinkages for three main reasons. First, EDZs in Northern Laos have developed around Belt Road Initiative transportation infrastructure, such as roads and railways. Two, these developments have facilitated Chinese investment in the region. And three, these systems for transport and trade are reshaping landscapes and livelihoods in Northern Laos, and in the process, creating new risks for illicit activity, 
such as corruption, environmental degradation, and wildlife trafficking. In Northern Laos, seven EDZs and two major infrastructure projects have been launched in the past two decades. National Route 3 was completed in 2008, connecting the Boten SEZ on the Chinese border to the Golden Triangle SEZ bordering Thailand and Myanmar. Another string of EDZs is now under development along the Boten Vientiane Railway, which will stretch through the interior of Laos from Boten to the capital and link to other railway projects throughout the region. Boten has hosted an economic development zone since 2003. By 2011, however, the zone's reputation as a gambling haven drew the attention of Chinese authorities, who reportedly urged the Laotian government to close the zone. Since 2016, Boten has undergone heavy construction to make way for the new railway and create space for urban development. Although the zone's casinos have been shuttered, it continues to draw tourists to its duty-free markets, where researchers have documented a range of illicit wildlife products for sale, including pangolin scales and tiger bone wine. Boten forms the northern end of National Route 3, which has opened up the remote mountainous interior of northwestern Laos to international trade, stimulating a new export-oriented agricultural economy. The route, which officially opened in March 2008, connects China to Thailand through the northern Laotian provinces of Luang Namtha and Bokeo. The arrival of National Route 3 coincided with the rubber boom in Luang Namtha, which picked up in 2001 to meet growing demand from China. This increased rapidly between 2004 and 2008 after China introduced the Opium Replacement Program, which subsidized Chinese rubber investment in Laos and stimulated the proliferation of processing facilities and trading networks in Luang Namtha. The development of this transportation corridor has created new risks for illicit activity, from land grabs and money laundering in the region's booming rubber industry to human trafficking along the highways and in its EDZs. The new railway and EDZs along it bear some similarities to the development of National Route 3. EDZ projects in Luang Prabang and Vientiane, although in varying stages of development, also include plans for agricultural processing facilities and industrial centers, and appear poised to cater to an influx of tourists along the railway. Policymakers can use the case of National Route 3 to anticipate challenges that may arise in the development of the Boten Vientiane corridor. Functioning as hubs for logistics, trade, and tourism along new arteries of transportation, these EDZs could generate economic growth, but will likely also increase vulnerability to land grabs, environmental degradation, and trade disparities. And uh, with that, I will open it up to any questions. Thanks, Henry. Uh, we do have a couple questions in the chat. So first off, what about human trafficking? The huge amount of migrant workers in Thailand might include large amounts of victims of forced labor and human trafficking. It's a very good point. Um, human trafficking uh, was, um, I guess, included in the Lao deep dive, but um, in general, we chose um, not to include that as an analytical category um, of illicit activity. Um, due to um, measurement difficulties uh, more than anything. Thank you. Um, next question is about the illicit activity measurement. So is the analysis baseline to a country average? Can you show that zones specifically are causing this illicit activity? It's difficult to compare um, to, I guess, isolate the effect of zones from baseline levels of corruption or illicit activity. Um, we know that uh, all of the countries analyzed in this zone fall um, in the uh, lower rankings of the Transparency International's Corruption Perceptions Index, for example. However, given the uh, role that uh, EDZs play as sort of convergence points for uh, licit transportation infrastructure, uh, we can expect uh, for this reason that um, illicit trade would also flourish along these areas. Okay. Um, another question, how can local communities get involved in the process of trying to protect EDZs from environmental degradation and land disputes, corruption, et cetera, 
both in um, how can they be involved in both collecting and receiving data? Um, I think this study um, underscores the importance of strong uh, local journalism, investigative journalism, and civil society organizations, and also points to the role that organizations like C4ADS can play as clearinghouses for uh, investigative data that can be uh, brought to bear on uh, the, the study and exposure of illicit activity. Um, so uh, I think it involves creating uh, a network of actors at both the international and local level who can exchange uh, data and knowledge and get that information into uh, places where it can be actionable. Thanks, Henry. I think we have one more or one more, two more questions depending on time for you. Um, first being, how can the AIS data analysis um, relate to the trafficking or be used to uh, research the trafficking of wildlife? Um, well, in cases where um, AIS data, um, where, where wildlife is trafficked by maritime vessels, um, AIS data can be sort of um, corroborated with data from corporate registries and customs records, um, especially if uh, predicate offenses have been identified in order to uh, build out networks and uh, monitor uh, activities uh, related to those networks. However, um, I think aircraft data might be um, generally more useful uh, for monitoring wildlife trafficking, given the role that the air sector plays in uh, that illicit trade. Thanks, Henry. Uh, one final question. Is there any documentation concerning corruption in Lebanon, as now the country um, is falling into a unique crisis um, and such documentation could be used to help Lebanese people who are suing politicians? Um, I, off the top of my head, I, I, I'm not exactly uh, sure about the data environment in Lebanon. I think that's something that we could um, uh, answer in a follow-up. Um, but I'm sure that there is some room for um, investigation and certainly um, uh, data sources that could be used in that regard. Thanks, Henry. Um, that's all the questions for now, and we'll turn it back over to Ben. Thank you, Faith and Henry. So our third analytical vertical is geopolitics. And as with illicit activity, uh, Geopolitics is uh, traditionally an external consideration that's not brought into EDZ impact assessment, uh, but we found it to be one that can factor heavily into the ultimate outcomes of a zone. And as with illicit activity, uh, we see some similar challenges uh, around the fact that they might be intentionally, uh, these types of activities and the signals that they emit might be intentionally obfuscated. And also, we're only aware of what we can see, of course, using publicly available information. Uh, and then on top of that, there's a few additional challenges that are more specific to geopolitics. The first uh, is it's very difficult, uh, if at all possible, to truly confirm the motivation behind an action or a statement. And uh, sometimes this can shed a uh, Geopolitical commentary can shed more light on the perspectives as the commentators than um, motivations behind the activity. You can even see instances where two different commentators with different perspectives uh, might draw different geopolitical conclusions from the same event. And in, in that sense, it can almost serve as a, as a Rorschach test for your, for your geopolitical perspective. Uh, a second issue is that geopolitics uh, and the reporting and available information around it can vary by investor country or company. Uh, we see this uh, based on the differences in reputations uh, around 
uh, different countries or companies and how that can affect uh, the decisions that people have to report on these uh, activities and the, the uh, portrayal of them as well. So for example, um, China is a very, very prominent investor in the region. Um, they have a lot of coverage, they have a lot of activities, so they have a lot of coverage, um, but there's a lot of attention given to uh, sort of Chinese investments and in certain countries, in certain areas, for example, you know, Vietnam uh, has tense relationship with China uh, and that can, uh, of course, factor into how events are portrayed and interpreted. A third uh, challenge is that, uh, of course, political interests can drive commercial activities. Uh, but we've seen the opposite as well, where commercial interests have either uh, leveraged political interests for the uh, political priorities for their own gain, uh, or have even um, influenced the, the priorities of the, the investor countries um, themselves. Um, and finally, you know, as we mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, um, host governments have the purview to decide uh, whether certain outcomes are worth uh, the advancements in economic development or infrastructure. Um, and this is, you know, geopolitics is just another, another piece of that uh, decision. So uh, with those caveats in mind, we set out to leverage publicly available information to evaluate the geopolitical impact of EDZs. Uh, and our framework focuses on three verticals. Uh, those are contract terms, uh, foreign activities, and the physical characteristics of the zone. So firstly, the physical characteristics of an EDZ, uh, and this is the ability of things like uh, access to a strategic resource um, or infrastructure in the zone um, that would change the strategic operating environment. Um, for example, in, in Myanmar, uh, the Dawei and Chaopu SEZs um, have been highlighted as offering investors like Japan or China access to the Malacca Strait. Um, uh, or access around the Malacca Strait. Um, we've already touched on the data sources uh, that you can see in red uh, that are related to this. We discussed them in the illicit activity section. Uh, so instead I wanted to highlight the types of questions we're trying to answer with this data. So geopolitics as a term is a, a pretty multifaceted concept and we wanna make sure that we're drawing on data to, to derive pointed insights rather than just crunching the numbers for numbers crunching sake. Um, what I will say about the methodology here is that there's a lot of potential with passive monitoring to, um, to evaluate the physical characteristics of a zone and, of course, to um, monitor in case there are any, if there are any unexpected changes or expected changes and how these might affect um, the strategic operating environment. And one last note I'll make here is that um, you know, strategic resources, you know, of course, this can be access to a, a sea line of communication. It can be uh, a physical uh, resource like um, you know, water or timber um, or something, or rubber, uh, but it can also be access to something less concrete, uh, potentially sort of a political resource uh, or something that's not necessarily uh, tangible. So with that, we'll move on to our second uh, subcategory here, which is contract terms. Um, and this is uh, important given uh, the um, context in which the country, uh, in which the zone, the country, the context of the country that the zone is located in. Um, for example, in Laos, uh, which has the highest um, foreign owned debt uh, of any Mekong country, it's just, um, and the majority of that is held by China. Um, six of Laos' 15 official EDZs uh, are majority held by Chinese entities. And so um, this type of situation gives China significant leverage that it could bring to bear in discussions around regional issues like water use rights. Uh, it's worth noting that these terms aren't necessarily a foregone conclusion. Um, for example, Myanmar appears to have um, negotiated down the stake of the Chinese investor CITIC in the Chapu SEZ from 85% to 70%. In terms of data, um, investment and debt figures are typically available at the national level. Um, although municipal data statistics are important, uh, as we've sometimes seen transnational investment, uh, either campaigns or partnerships uh, that occur directly between cities or provinces and not at the national level. That being said, these financial statistics, um, they only provide the context and to understand the implications of the contract terms, uh, you of course need to see the actual contract or at least the data behind it. And this is uh, an area that um, 
there could be much improvement in the, the data environment uh, around Mekong EDCs. And finally, we have uh, the foreign actors vertical, which evaluates how a foreign inve investor's characteristics, actions, or statements can shed light on their geopolitical goals. Um, for example, in Myanmar, three of seven planned zones um, in which a foreign actor holds a controlling stake involve investors who are officially affiliated with a host government. And specifically, those governments are China, South Korea, and Singapore. Um, in addition to the sort of country level analysis, looking at specific entities active in the region, uh, we identified EDZ activities that can shape the regional operating environment. So for example, the overseas security guardians allegedly use Sihanoukville port as a maritime escort base to protect clients' fisheries interests. Um, and so one note I'll make here is that even with corporate ownership, uh, with access to corporate records, um, identifying uh, the affiliations of um, investors or other entities can be tricky when you move across multiple jurisdictions. And I'll note that this is an excellent area for civil society to supplement government data collection activities. With that, uh, we'll move to our third deep dive, which looks at Chinese private security companies operating in the Mekong region. So I'll note that this study looks at PSC, private security company activity uh, across the entire region. And that is not specifically limited to economic development zones. Uh, we do see PSCs active in specific zones, uh, but for this deep dive, we chose to take a broader look at an emerging trend that appears to follow increased Chinese investment in the region. So with increased investment comes the need to protect uh, those assets. And some of that protection has come through the form of private security companies. For the two countries that we were able to get systems level data, uh, that is uh, Cambodia and Myanmar, PSCs in the region are overwhelmingly owned by Chinese entities. You can see 29 of 49 companies. These PSCs allow the Chinese government an alternative to putting official military boots on the ground. Um, that's gonna av help avoid potential international criticism or host country domestic backlash. And these PSCs can still serve as a vector for hard or soft power. Now, in addition, we find that the PSC industry is under-regulated both at the national and international level, which means that there's ample opportunity and little oversight uh, included for foreign actors. Just as an illustration of this, uh, a former Macau triad member named Wan Kuo Kai entered the industry several years after his release from prison in 2012. He declared that his company, Hongmen Security, would protect Chinese investments in the Belt and Road Initiative in Southeast Asia. Uh, and here we can see again, the um, is an example of the interplay between commercial interests and political priorities here. Uh, Wan capitalized on uh, the Chinese political priority of the Belt and Road Initiative uh, to further his commercial interests in the company. Now the Chinese government uh, has disavowed Wan and his company's operations, um, but this is an illustration of how in this type of unregulated, underregulated environment, um, the lines between investment and security and politics and illicit activity can become uh, pretty blurred. So with that, I will open it up for questions. Thanks, Ben. We have two questions right now in the Q&A section. So first question. Is China or China-based entities more likely to invest in economic development zones versus normal areas of the region? That's a good question. Um, I would say we didn't we didn't look at um, comparing EDZ versus non-EDZ investments. Um, we focused specifically on on, on economic development zones. Um, I, I would say I don't I couldn't I couldn't say in a sort of a data backed way, uh, but I, I, I can say that there is a lot of Chinese investment um, sort of on both sides of that. Uh, so I don't have a better answer for you, but um, it would be very interesting if you're interested in sort of pulling data on that uh, to look more deeply. Um, please feel free to reach out. Second question, uh, how were you able to gain access to zone contract terms? Are those documents centralized anywhere that's publicly accessible? The short answer is no, they are not. 
Um, we have some anecdotal access to uh, contracts. There, there are cases where the contracts are publicly reported and available. Um, there are a lot of cases, I would say the majority is those contracts are, are not uh, openly available. And um, because of the nature of publicly available, publicly available information, um, we can't say, you know, for certain whether it's because these contracts are, you know, we're not saying that these contracts are being deliberately obfuscated. We're saying that uh, they're just not available. And so this might be, uh, this might highlight the need for a sort of a digitization effort or um, potentially using something like natural language processing to structure the contracts, um, maybe some other sort of data pipelines to centralize them into a, uh, into a searchable repository, something like that. Uh, but the short answer is, no, uh, there's not a great centralized uh, resource for this, but it's certainly an area that would be highly impactful uh, in terms of shaping the data environment. One final question for you. Uh, what can zone management authorities do about security concerns from foreign countries? Is that not the job of the central government or military? Yeah, so the, the I mean, Depending on the, the government, uh, you know, the different different bureaus have different mandates, but uh, yeah, typically zone management authorities are, are responsible for the, the sort of administration of the zone and maybe the, the, the economic performance. But um, this is something that is not traditionally in the purview of zone management authorities. We're not necessarily arguing that um, it should be, but we are certainly saying that zone management authorities are extremely well placed to collect that sort of data and provide that data to whoever in the government does have that mandate. And that's one of the reasons that we emphasize the, the collaboration aspect, not just between government and say civil society, but also within government agencies, because you know zones have such um, complex impact uh, in terms of not only economic development, but also on the environment, also on um, organized crime, also on geopolitics. There is a need for a um, sort of multifaceted uh, response, or at least approach to um, impact evaluation and and risk mitigation. Great, thank you, Ben. I think that's all the questions we have for now. Okay. Well, with that, uh, we will move to our platform demo. So I'm just going to um, close this. Um, PowerPoint, and then I'll open up the website. Okay. So first we'll navigate to the C4 ADS website. And if we go to reports here, and then we scroll down to zoned out and click learn more, we're brought to uh, the platform. And this is the, um, the, best, the best way to navigate uh, to the platform. Uh, but if you're interested in the, the URL itself, uh, it's right here as well. So, um, so to frame the demo, uh, we hope that the, the platform is going to advance the recommendations that we made earlier in the presentation. So specifically, uh, the platform is an open centralized repository of some information on uh, economic development zones. Uh, it leverages emerging technology for evaluative, pro uh, evaluative processes. Uh, and finally, it um, we hope that it will facilitate collaboration uh, between um, the variety of stakeholders that can be um, tapped to reduce the negative impacts of zones. The one last thing I want to emphasize before we dive in is that this is not a one-stop shop for everything that you could possibly want to know about EDZs, uh, and we certainly would recommend that it's used in conjunction with other uh, sources of information. That being said, we believe this platform will provide stakeholders and observers, especially those without access to privileged information, um, a great um, sort of touchstone for a variety of data, including underlying sources. So with that, we'll jump into the website. 
Uh, so we can see here, uh, we have our three uh, analytical verticals here. Uh, this is a sort of interactive version of the findings of the report. Of course, if you're interested in the report uh, in, in full, including uh, underlying sources, uh, feel free to download the report right here. Um, but you can see uh, we have the economic development framework. Um, each of the sections will have the, the, the framework that we're talking about from this presentation. Uh, and because it's a website, we can have a little bit more uh, interactive features that are going here. Um, and we'll just move through this a little bit more. This is a section that Max was talking about in terms of the remote sensing and the um, prediction of human activity in the region. Um, and with that, we'll move back. Um, so not only do we have the analysis on here, but uh, the analytical verticals, but we also have um, the deep dives. And we'll use the website to explore uh, our final two deep dives, um, which will be Sihanoukville SEZ and uh, or Sihanoukville and then Shwekoko. So with that, I'll turn it over to Max, uh, who will be uh, discussing uh, the Sihanoukville deep dive. Thank you, Ben. Um, so for this deep dive, uh, we're taking a look at Sihanoukville SEZ, which was founded in 2008 as part of the BRI, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, that is. And this study examines the consequences that this investment had on the city of Sihanoukville. Um, and since the time of the original BRI investment, Ch Chinese investment in the city of Sihanoukville and Cambodia in general have increased dramatically. By early 2019, an estimated 90% of businesses in Sihanoukville were owned by Chinese nationals. And much of this was driven by the booming gambling industry. And there was construction all over the city as more than 80 casinos were opened. And because this expansion was so rapid, infrastructure in the city couldn't keep up with the demand, meaning that electric, garbage, sewage, and water systems were overwhelmed, resulting in frequent outages. And because many local people were excluded from the profits of the boom, as Chinese businesses did business with other Chinese entities, many locals were forced to move out of the city as food and rent prices were increasing dramatically. And then in August of 2019, uh, the prime minister of Cambodia issued a ban on online gambling, which was the driver of many of the profits for casinos in Sihanoukville. And this was widely believed to be under pressure from Beijing as China was beginning to crack down on overseas and online gambling in the region. Uh, and almost as a result, almost 80% of Chinese nationals living in the city left, and this boom came to a halt. By just December 2019, almost 8,000 Cambodians had lost jobs in casinos. Um, so this deep dive shows that raw economic expansion for its own sake is not always a benefit to local populations. And uh, the deep dive stresses the need for a comprehensive evaluation of zones that reviews the negative effects and geopolitical ram ramifications rather than simply a review of development. And with that, I'll turn back to Ben for our next deep dive. Thank you, Max. So uh, our final deep dive focuses on an unofficial EDZ. Uh, and for the purposes of the study, we define uh, an unofficial EDZ as a sub-provincial area that maintains a reputation as a hub for legal economic activity, uh, but is not officially designated as an EDZ by the host government. And here, uh, Shui Koko offers a cautionary tale of the importance of oversight and transparency. So the quote unquote zone, uh, which um, is known as both the Myanmar Yatai Shui Koko Special Economic Zone, as well as the New City Special Economic Zone, was created outside of existing structures, uh, which means it's not subject to uh, the typical oversight procedures of an EDC. However, Yatai International, the developing company, did receive permission from the Myanmar Investment Commission to construct luxury real estate in the, in the region. So development was championed by this company, Yatai International Holdings, a Chinese company that's directed by an individual named Shu Kailun, uh, who is also known as Shu Zhejiang, uh, a Chinese national who has a, a criminal record. Uh, Yatai International claimed that this project was part of China's Belt and Road Initiative, again, the interplay between political and commercial priorities. Um, however, the Chinese embassy in Myanmar later disavowed Shu and his company. Yatai International Holdings partnered with a Burmese company uh, no, owned by the Kayan State Border Guard Force, uh, which is a former insurgent group and the de facto power broker in the region. Uh, 
the two parties reportedly split the profit 70-30, with the majority flowing back to Yata International. Uh, construction broke ground in 2017. Uh, by 2019, the zone had purportedly become a regional hub for illicit gambling operations. Uh, this was largely driven by the ban on casinos in Sihanoukville, uh, as we heard about recently. Uh, it's worth noting that Yata International ran advertisements in Sihanoukville after the ban was announced, uh, allegedly in an attempt to attract uh, gamblers from Sihanoukville to Shuikoko. Um, Shuikoko's reputation became so well known that earlier this year, uh, the Burmese government took steps to disrupt the zone's operations. Uh, the, to disrupt the illicit activity around the zone. They ousted the leader of the Cayenne State Border Guard Force and announced plans to develop a framework uh, for Shwekoko's operations. Of course, now in the wake of the recent coup, the fate of Shwekoko is, is unclear. So to zoom out, uh, Shwekoko is an unofficial EDZ uh, that was co-opted by a foreign actor for illicit activity. However, it's not really a story of subterfuge. Now, the Burmese government was at least aware of the development, uh, having approved the permits for the construction. Rather, this deep dive highlights the necessity of oversight and regulation. If the host government cannot ensure rule of law, then commercial hubs like EDZs can become havens for transnational illicit activity. Uh, we'll pause here if there are any questions around those two deep dives. Uh, otherwise, we will jump into the other features of the website. Thanks, Ben. Um, there are currently no uh, questions in the Q&A. Um, I'll, I'll flag if any come in throughout the rest of the presentation. Okay. So uh, to recap what we've seen in the website so far, of course, we have our analytical verticals here. We have the deep dives, um, but now we'll jump into some of the features uh, that are unique to the website uh, that is not, they're not contained in the report. So uh, here we see the uh, zone explorer, uh, and this is a, a map that includes uh, a database of zones for which shape files were available. Uh, this is to show the geography of zones, uh, this is potentially a first step in looking at some of the physical characteristics, for instance, the potential to give access to a strategic resource. Um, to pull this data together, uh, we um, identified shape files uh, in the publicly available information. Uh, we also partnered, uh, we worked with our data partners, um, such as Stimson and the, Open, the Stimson Center and the Open Development Initiative. Um, who generously provided uh, data in support of this as well. Um, in addition, we created new shape files based on maps and images uh, of zones um, to, to add to this, this collection. So if we wanted to drill down into one, you can scroll through the zones that are listed, or you can search one. For example, we'll look at MDS Morda. Um, uh, and here we can see some basic information about the zones. Um, and this is uh, sort of a, a key repository here. Uh, one thing I'll note is that um, for the polygons uh, here, you can, um, for anyone that has a polygon available, you can click on this and you will see the uh, nightlight data, uh, which is uh, the performance of the zone. Uh, the data is available from 2012 onwards as well as um, the satellite construction um, building increase data, which is available from January 2018 uh, through the end of 2020. Um, in addition to this data, you can also pull, uh, there's information links to um, data around the industry location and investment breakdown. So if we, for example, click on this um, industry, page, we're taken to an external website. Um, so just be aware that these are external websites, but these are intended as um, uh, additional repositories for more information, especially if you really want to dig down into the specifics of the zone. So we're intending this platform not only to be a repository of information, but also to be a, um, a launch pad to other, um, other pieces, uh, other data that's out there. 
Uh, so to move on uh, from the Zone Explorer to the network map. So here, um, the idea is to show the corporate networks um, and uh, ideally the ultimate beneficial owners that are connected to organizations or companies that are active in the zone. So the zone, um, the zones in here are larger and are marked by a, a map marker icon, um, whereas the companies and the individuals and other organizations are smaller and marked with their respective icon. And where a nationality of a company or an individual is confirmed, uh, the node will be colored by the nation's flag. So for example, uh, we could click on BO10. Um, we have uh, some basic information about the zone. We have um, links to additional information. Uh, so if we were to navigate here, again, this is a link to external information. That's of course a, a huge advantage of using publicly available information. Um, and um, that we're able to, to, to um, piece together the different, uh, the different uh, resources that are available. Uh, but let's, deep, let's uh, dive down into BO10. If we wanted to see co a company that are, uh, is linked to the zone, um, we could click on this one uh, and we see, of course, here a Hong Kong company. Uh, and we see uh, a variety of information here, of course, the type of organization it is, uh, the, the name in both English and Chinese. Uh, we see the nationality, the address, uh, and the unique ID number that can be used to reference the company in other types of documents. Uh, in addition, we can see individuals uh, and other uh, types of entities that are linked to the company. For example, if we wanted to see the uh, information on the owner, we could click on this individual. Again, we see the name, English and Chinese. We have the address. Uh, and thanks to the Hong Kong registry, we also have an ID number for Huang Ming Chen. Uh, and the, of course, the other individual here is the company secretary. Um, if we were interested in looking at a specific zone, uh, say the Thai um, Eastern Economic Corridor, uh, we could click on the zone here. And then uh, the network specifically behind the Thai uh, Eastern Economic Corridor would, would filter here. And if we wanted to look at um, a click on an entity here, um, this one is the, the China Harbor Engineering Company Joint Venture. Um, again, we see identifying information. Uh, we see um, links to additional resources uh, and this registration number. And so, um, you know, as we mentioned in both the illicit activity and geopolitics sections, you know, we believe that knowing the ultimate beneficial owners uh, behind investors or other companies that are active in the zone um, is, a, is a prerequisite to fully understanding the impacts of an EDZ. So now maybe, maybe you're not interested in specific um, companies that are linked to the EEC, but maybe you just want to have more, find out more information about the breakdown of foreign uh, or domestic ownership, or even um, a breakdown in ownership by country. So for that, you go back to the Zone Explorer. And if we wanted to navigate directly to the EEC, uh, and we could move down here and we could click on Foreign Investment Source. We do that. Um, we uh, redirects us to, again, this is external underlying information. Uh, this is actually a really great overview of the EEC that is also available for other Thai zones. Uh, and so if we scroll down here, of course, we can see um, a breakdown of uh, investment by, by country. So all of this information and more uh, is available on the website. Um, I'm happy to take any questions about um, the website right now. Uh, and um, if there's other features that people are interested in, in exploring. Thanks, Ben, for that demonstration. We do have a couple of the questions. First one being, will C480S make the zone shape files publicly available for download to support additional analysis by regional scholars and practitioners? Yeah, uh, if 
If you're interested in accessing the polygons, um, feel free to uh, reach out to us directly. We do want to support uh, the sort of proliferation of relevant data. Uh, and yeah, that's a conversation that we're, we're really happy to have. Um, a similar question, will the data for um, the source data and, and the nightlight analysis and corporate networks be updated over time? Uh, yeah, so the, the project is um, sadly coming, it's coming to a close, but C4ADS is opening to uh, continuing the project and facilitating others uh, in building on the current data. So uh, if anyone is interested in that effort, um, please reach out and we'd be happy to discuss um, further you know, sharing of our detailed methodology uh, and underlying data. Another question um, is the potential environmental impact. Is there air pollution data that can be used as an indicator to monitor an EDC? Uh, so do, we did not incorporate uh, air pollution data, but I do think that would be a really interesting um, really a really you know valuable indicator especially if you're able to have that data um, from before the establishment of the zone and then going forward uh, you could really make a strong argument for the impact of the zone on the air quality uh, and so that's something that uh, would probably be uh, I, i'm not immediately aware of a, a tool that could collect that at scale uh, but i would say certainly that would be a great opportunity for any on the ground stakeholders uh, if it's a community advocacy organization or uh, another type of entity that's on the ground uh, to collect that around a specific zone um additionally brian eiler um thanks everyone for developing the website and report and asks you know where does one go from here in terms of updating the data as well as what kind of local partners are you looking to engage? Um, well, yeah, and a, and a big thank you back to you uh, and your team, Brian, uh, at Stimson uh, for the, you know, your support in the, the, the data collection efforts. Um, in terms of the, the data being updated, uh, like we said, uh, the project's coming to a close, but we're very interested in, um, uh, sort of continuing the, the, the building of what we've done. And so i um, happy to discuss that further uh, if there's interest around the sort of methodology or the underlying data. Um, in terms of what kind of local partners uh, we're looking for, I mean, I'd say um, certainly, you know, those with a mandate to act um, first, um, because you know, we obviously don't have any any scope of decision-making authority, of course, over any of these activities. And so, you know, what we're trying to do is put this data in the hands of people that make those decisions. Um, uh, second, I would say people that are uh, directly affected, uh, you know, by the, the zones or people that are conducting, say, community advocacy. Um, you know, we want to, we, we see, you know, those types of groups as potentially the most uh, have the uh, the most to benefit from this type of data because they have a very high regional context and they can use this data uh, to advocate to, to to frame their own say advocacy operations or, or other types of um, activities that might help shape these zones towards uh, sustainable uh, inclusive development. And those would be the two big ones, um, but. Like I said uh, before, we're you know we're a nonprofit, and this is publicly available information. So we're very open to um, working with partners and supporting uh, you know good work wherever we can. Definitely. Um, another potentially final question: What is the best way to use the network map tool to conduct an investigation? So. Uh, what I would say is, you know, you, you'd want to start with um, a predicate offense. If you're doing an investigation, presumably this is an investigation into, say, a network. Um, and if there is a predicate offense to sort of begin that, um, you know, you may have, say, a, a zone that you're looking at that is a specific, um, you know, you know an, an incident happened here. Maybe it was an incident of, uh, say, human trafficking, uh, to call back to a question that was um, mentioned earlier. Uh, you know it happened in this zone. Uh, maybe you don't know the company right away. 
You could um, pull down the information around the companies that are linked in the zone, um, and you could start investigating those um, either in um, a database of court records. Uh, you could look for you know, previous offenses around the type of um, illicit activity that you're looking at. Um, you could start searching in the open source for derogatory reporting. Um, you could look at the other shareholdings of the investors in those companies to see if they, you know, it might be a, a company that is primarily involved in shipping, but the shareholder also has substantial fisheries interests. And that might be sort of a forced labor in the fisheries sector, which this um, company is using as cover. I mean, I'm, I'm sort of coming up with hypotheticals here, but uh, I, I definitely think that understanding the corporate networks behind um, a zone is going to help you uh, get a lot more specific in your investigations. Um, and of course, the alternative is if there's a specific company that you're interested in, uh, you could see where they're active in the region. Um, you can see the shareholders behind them. Um, and you can have, again, links to additional information about uh, either the companies, um, their activities in the zones, uh, or the shareholders themselves. So I hope that answers the question. Feel free to, uh, to follow up if, if there's something more specific that you were looking for. Thanks, Ben. Um, there are no other questions in the chat at this time. If anyone else does have questions, please feel free to add them uh, to the Q&A um, as we begin to wrap up. Okay. Well, if nobody has any more questions for me, then I actually have a question for you all uh, in the form of a poll. Uh, so we'll uh, open that poll up now. Uh, so I hope everybody was was really keyed in during the presentation, uh, and we'll see what the uh, what the results of this are. I'll give it maybe a minute. Okay, we'll go ahead and process the results there. All right, looks like uh, most people got it got it dead on. Um, yeah, of course the the um, the underlying tenet of publicly available information is that it's publicly available, uh, and so. Uh, there, there's no specific um, authority or privilege that is required to access the data. So with that, we will close the poll. I'm going to switch back to the PowerPoint and we will uh, bring it home. So we covered a pretty wide range of topics uh, and regions and impacts uh, and, and, and platforms over the presentation. Uh, and there's of course even more on the website, uh, but what are some key takeaways to end on? So number one is uh, economics doesn't tell the whole story. That there are non-economic impacts to economic development zones, uh, both uh, financial and intangible. Number two, 
that uh, the, a non-permissive data environment is bad for everybody, uh, except for illicit actors. And so governments, of course, have an enormous mandate uh, by themselves. And if they don't have sufficient resources uh, or access, uh, they may be lacking uh, the ability to make informed decisions. And of course, uh, local communities and stakeholders and advocacy organizations um, lack agency in the sense that they're uh, not able to see the full picture, uh, which would help better um, them advocate for their position. And number three, um, zone impact evaluation should be a collaborative effort. So host governments can benefit from the additional resources brought to bear on the issue. Uh, local stakeholders can benefit from increased engagement uh, and understanding of the, the, the nuances of the impacts. Um, international observers have an opportunity to advance democratic values. Um, and of course, this would uh, tacitly increase commercial opportunities for um, ethical investors and companies. So the, the website uh, synthesizes the methodologies that we discussed here into a comprehensive framework uh, across all three analytical verticals that constitutes uh, a first pass test for zone impact. So what we mean by that is this is not an exhaustive test of impact, nor does it capture all of the nuance. Uh, for example, we saw with Sihanoukville, uh, you know, uh, uh, nightlight data can perform very strongly, but there can be much more to the sort of economic health of a zone. Um, so while zones can quote unquote pass this framework and still have negative consequences, um, in the other direction, any zone that performs poorly on this framework uh, should be very closely scrutinized. So we believe that the data environment can be shaped uh, to allow ordinary individuals and organizations to participate in impact evaluation, uh, and that all stakeholders should seek to accelerate this process, opening up new lines of analysis and lowering the threshold for participation. So with that, uh, we'll wrap up. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, we have five minutes left. Uh, happy to discuss further here. Otherwise, uh, our contact information is on the screen. Um, please feel free to reach out. We'd be happy to discuss further. Thanks for taking the time today. Thank you, Ben, um, and thank you everyone from joining uh, from you know, all around the world today. Uh, enjoy the rest of your mornings, afternoons, and evenings. I don't believe we have any other questions in uh, the Q&A box at this time, but as Ben said, feel free to reach out to any of these email addresses, or you can find our uh, general email address on the Mekong or C4ADS um, website. So yes, have a good rest of your day and appreciate you all attending.